God's hand. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Without any delay, I want you to turn with me to the book of the prophet Isaiah. I want you to read with me and allow your Bibles to remain open to the 54th chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we're reading together verses 16 and 17. If you have that, say amen. Come on, let's read it together. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Oh, praise God. Verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Just turn to somebody and say those words. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. You really ought to just stand up and tell about three people around you that because you don't know what they're going through. Hallelujah. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I thank God, hallelujah. I don't know of any words of scripture that would be more consoling to God's people in this present day and age than the recognition of the fact we have God's promise. For this is a day when I cannot help but go back a few years when the Democratic candidate Walter Mondale was running for the office of President of the United States. And a part of his platform was nuclear disarmament. And whenever he would mention the weapons of destruction that were in the hands of the superpowers, he would say, and we've got to get rid of these God-awful weapons. And the weapons that man have devised in this day and time, we have seen nuclear proliferation come to an end. We have seen the uh, superpower of the Soviet Union uh, come to naught. And yet there are many missiles that are in the hands of unstable governments which yet create a potential threat to the civilization of mankind. But on a more practical note, we have just experienced even in our city and in many other cities, the exchange 
of food for guns because the Saturday night specials and the various uh, revolvers and automatic weapons in the hands not only of street gangs but the average school child if he wants it can get his hands on a weapon we live in a day when it doesn't matter how careful you are you don't know when you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and be the victim of someone who is wielding a weapon so we're concerned about weapons in the natural but we're also concerned about weapons in the spiritual because the devil has an arsenal and he's not so concerned with destroying his own he's already got them but he is constantly attempting to release his arsenal of weapons against the saints but we have God's assurance look at somebody again and tell them no weapon <laughs> that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper now this is addressed the very last sentence says this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me saith the Lord you see the devil he tries to play games with God understand that even when Moses came to his dying hour and the Lord called him up on the mountain and uh, Moses had to go to sleep the sleep of death in a private ceremony nobody was there but God as the eulogist and the angels were there as the pallbearers and grave diggers and while they were in the process of putting Moses to rest the devil showed up and said the body of Moses belongs to me yet Michael the archangel in contending with Satan over the body of Moses did not bring a railing accusation but simply said Satan the Lord rebuke thee why would the devil have the audacity to want to claim the body of Moses who was a great leader and had led the people of God as great as Moses was he made a mistake he made the mistake of spoiling the type, the rock, which was to be smitten once, symbolizing Jesus being smitten on the cross. Moses, in anger, hit the rock for a second time. And because of that one mistake, God didn't let him go into the promised land, but the devil wanted to even take possession of him. And don't you fool yourself when you have done all trying to live for God the enemy will afflict you with a guilt complex and the devil will tell you because of that mistake you made that I'm going to let my weapons tear you asunder but God says that if you're his child no weapon formed against you will prosper this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord not because of their righteousness because all your righteousness is as filthy rags but your righteousness is of me hallelujah when I stepped on the promise of God when I put myself in the master's hand he became my righteousness and sometimes I might slip up but thank God it's not as bad as the saints had us thinking when I was a child we saw God like as an old man with a stick in his hand calling us to a tight rope walk and if by chance you just happen to laugh too loud, they made you feel like he was going to hit you across your big head and you were going to fall down into the bottomless pit. But the Lord has invested so much in your salvation that he's not out to destroy you, he's out to save you. And when the weapons come flying at you, they are not God's making. They are the devil's making. And God says that the devil's weapons will not prosper. Let's look at the text, and I'm not going to be before you that long. We've got some other things to do this afternoon. This message comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, in fact, this is in fact the, uh, a part of what is called 2nd Isaiah. 
for all students of this prophet will quickly relate to you that uh, one man did not write the whole book. It is called 1st Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, and it is similar to the Bible itself. The Bible has uh, 66 books and uh, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. Uh, Isaiah, 1st Isaiah has 39 chapter and the second part of Isaiah has 27. So does the Old Testament have 39 and 27. And there are a lot of similarities between uh, the book of Isaiah and the Bible itself. I will not take the time to go into all of that today, but when we come to chapter 54, which is automatically a part of second Isaiah, this chapter, uh, has six movements in it. Six movements are six uh, musical, uh, poetic, uh, if you want to use rhythmic terms, six strophes they are called. It opens with the first strophe, which is verse one through three. And I want you for a moment to look at the beginning of chapter 54. And let's read verses one through three. Come on and read it with me. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud that thou didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtain of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be habitated. Now, what you see here, the prophet speaks of Jerusalem, the children of Israel, as the bereaved and widowed mother. Understand that in that day and time, uh, there was nothing more embarrassing than for a woman to go childless. And the Lord is saying of Jerusalem that you are the bereaved and widowed mother. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Chaldeans in 586 BC and all Judea lay in ruins. This destruction was symbolic of God's divorce from his people Israel. But even though Israel had provoked God to the extent that it was like a divorced bride, God promises that the one who was barren, solitary, and separated from her husband while exiled in Babylon will end up with more children than in the time of her marriage prior to uh, the captivity. God is saying that before 586 BC, before the Chaldean invasion, before the deportation down into Babylon, uh, you were my bride, but you uh, had some children. Now I've divorced you and allowed you to go down in the captivity where you stayed for 70 years. You've come back all bruised and come back embarrassed and you've come back childless but God says that when I get through this uh, bride that had a few children before the captivity and now you are just a barren woman but I'm going to give you more in the end than you had in the beginning now you may not have noticed but that's the way God does things notice even in the life of Job all that Job had before his affliction came upon him. But when you get to the last chapter, Job, God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and he had what? Twice as much as he had at first. God has a way of allowing his people to be tested, allowing his people to go into captivity, and in the case of Israel and the Babylon, God declares that he did it himself. 
because of their disobedience. But in the end, he promises that you're going to be better on the end than you were in the beginning. Consequently, when they come back from their captivity down in the land of Babylon, and when those who were building the temple, the man of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, who had been assigned the task of rebuilding, he asked the question, look out those of you and see if there's any left who saw this house in a first glory. You saw it first, now look at it now. How do you see it now? When Solomon built it, it was beautiful, but now it's in shambles. But God said, after the shakeup, I want you to know that the latter glory is going to be greater than the former glory. I think about Samson, strong man that was stronger than any man that had ever been. He was able to kill a young lion with his bare hands. When a group of Philistines thought they had him cornered, he grabbed the jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand Philistines. And here was a man that they were scared of. Finally, they put out his eyes, cut off his hair, and threw him in prison. And he ended up grinding in the mill. How be it, his hairs began to grow again. And say what you want to, it doesn't matter what the devil have done, God knows how to let your hair grow again. And in the end, in the end, glory to God, he was able to go to the temple of Dagon, their idol God, and had a young man to lead him with his blind self to the two pillars where the house stood. And he put one hand on one and the other hand on the other. And when he pushed the pillars and the temple of Dagon came falling down, the Bible said more Philistines were killed at his death than all of them that he had slain together at his life. God just got a way that when you think it's over, as Sister Sean said, my times are in his hand. And you may think it's over, but God says, I'm going to let you live again. I'm going to bless you again. I'm going to anoint you again. I'm going to let you come forth again. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Chaldeans in 586, and all Judea lay in ruins. This destruction was a symbol of God's divorce from his people Israel. But God promises that the one who was barren, solitary, and separated from her husband while exiled in Babylon will end up with more children than in the time of her marriage prior to the captivity. And verse 2 simply says, because I'm going to do that, enlarge the place of thy tents. In other words, that God said, I'm going to give you more children, so add some more rooms. Start now making your house bigger. See, whenever God tells you something, you can build on it. You don't have to worry. I wonder, is it so? I wonder, will it happen? If the Lord said it, <laughs> you can build your future on it. You can build your house on it. Glory to God. You can build your future on whatever God has said. Praise the name of Jesus. Verse 3 lets us know that the children of Jerusalem, not only will God enlarge his people to the degree that they've got to enlarge their tent, stretch forth the curtain of thine habitation, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. In other words, just let the tent get bigger. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. Thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. God said to Israel, you don't have to worry. You can start enlarging your quarters because not only am I going to give you the children that will be the natural seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the Gentiles are going to also be included. And that's why I say that we've got to be mighty careful uh, as people who love God and as Christians getting caught up in a lot of ethnic uh, rhetoric. Hello, somebody. You know, I don't care how you may hear some persons 
talk about the Jews this and the Jews that. Don't let anybody stir you up to a point of hating a nation that God has so wonderfully blessed. Because don't forget, uh, whether Jesus was tan, brown, or black, he still was a Jew. And all of those men who were his first disciples, they still were Jews. And we have a directive from the Lord in the book of Psalms to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We cannot detach ourselves and think that we have a religion that is just simply black. Hello, somebody. Because God has included us as seeds of Abraham. When you read what Paul has to say, he said, whosoever has faith, you are Abraham's seed. And uh, that's why I don't read the Bible and give all of the promises in there to somebody else. When I start reading of how God promised that I'm gonna bless you in the city, I'm gonna bless you in the field, I'm gonna bless the fruit of your body, I'm gonna bless this, I'm gonna bless, I'm gonna bless, and you can say, oh, he's talking to the seed of Abraham. He's talking to me. Because if I've got faith, I too am inclusive in the seed of Abraham. Well, when we move from this uh, first strophe, we come to uh, the second. And this comes from verse uh, 4 and 5. Read verse 4 and 5. Fear not. For thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. He's saying here that I want you to understand, Israel, fear not. You were invaded by the Chaldeans. You were captured by the Babylonian Empire. But fear not. You don't have to worry because of what happened. Because God is saying even the thing that happened to you in your youth, he's referring here back to the time in Egypt. Understand now that the first hostility that Israel encountered was as slaves in Egypt. And this thing that happens in Babylon is their second exposure to captivity. He said, I want you to know you don't have to fear what has happened in the past. And the Lord begins to unravel in verse 5 who he is and the ways in which he is related to his people. He says, first of all, I'm thy maker. I made you. Secondly, I'm your husband. Next, I'm your redeemer. And then I'm Israel's holy one. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And the last thing he says here is soon, you know, all over the world, I'll be known as the God of the whole earth. But back in that day, Israel's God was more or less reserved to Israel and a few nations round about. Other people were worshiping their idols. But the God that was Israel's maker, the God that was Israel's redeemer, said he shall be known as the God of the whole earth. And now it doesn't matter where you go. You can call him Yahweh or you can call him Jehovah. But in the far-flung regions of the earth, the same God that brought Israel out of Egypt is the God that we glorify today. I'm not glorifying some uh, mythical unnamed deity, but it's the same God, the same one that stretched out the heavens, the same one that made the earth, the same one that created man from the dust of the ground. That same God is our God. Let's move on down to the fourth movement here and that's verse 9 and 10 do you have your Bibles come on and read that with me for the, for as I formed the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee 
for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed but my kindness shall not depart from thee neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed saith the lord that hath mercy on thee oh praise the name of jesus emphasis on god's everlasting covenant the king james version said the waters of noah the revived standard versions virgin says the uh days of noah god reminds them of just like in the time of noah after the flood waters had abated that i put my bow in the heavens and i made that as a covenant between myself and mankind that it doesn't matter how it rains doesn't matter how the rivers flood never again will i destroy the whole of mankind by water god is saying i want you to know that just like i made that covenant with noah that which i allowed to happen to you down in babylon i won't allow that to happen to you anymore the mountains may depart they may shake no matter what happened you don't have to worry because god says it will not happen again we move down to the fifth movement and i'm rushing verses 11 12 13 and 14 let's read them all thou afflicted tossed with tempest and not comforted behold i will lay thy stone with fair colors and lay thy foundation with sapphires and i will make thy windows of agate and thy gates of carbuncle and all thy borders of pleasant stone and all thy children shall be taught of the lord and great shall be the peace of thy children in righteousness shall thou be established thou shalt be far from oppression for thou shalt not fear and from terror for that shall come all right all right praise god listen to what he's saying here god is saying "O oh, afflicted one israel is bowed down in misery in her present enslaved condition she storm tossed disconcerted and troubled by the events she has experienced but as i read verse 12 from the revised standard version it says i will make your pinnacles of agate which is a hard semi-precious stone your gates of carbuncle which is another kind of gem and all your walls of precious stones hallelujah then he moves in verse 13 after saying how i'm going to beautify the city itself the outward appearance then he moves to the inner appearance some of us only get concerned about how we look on the outside we'll spend hours in the morning getting ready for church because we know it's going to be hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand people there. And I want everything to look right from every strand of hair right down to the tip of my toes. I want people when they see me to know that I'm together. And then you'll come to church late and you'll sit there and talk all during the sermon. And anything that will help dress you up on the inside you don't have time for. You ought to touch somebody and tell them, but God wants us not only dressed up outside, but he wants us dressed up on the inside. And if you can't say amen, say ouch. From the physical splendor of the new Jerusalem, the prophet turns to her inward glory and verse 13 says all thy children shall be taught of the lord and great shall be the peace of thy children verse 14 in righteousness shalt thou be established thou shalt be far from oppression for thou shalt not fear and from terror for it shall not come near thee God said, I know you may be in a bad shape now, but when I get through fixing you up, you're not going to have to worry about the days of your youth when you were slaves in Egypt. 
You're not going to have to worry about those that came against you, the Chaldeans, and deported you down in the Babylon. And in this day, Israel was experiencing an unfolding of many different weapons. From the beginning, the caveman didn't have anything but a stone. Hello, somebody. But as man has continued to live, he has created new weapons and new systems of weapons. But God is saying to them, it doesn't matter what kind of weaponry you have been exposed to, nor what they will come up with in the future. Behold, I have created the smith. Do you see that? Well, who is the smith? A smith is a skilled worker in metals. Hmm? You heard of the goldsmith and the silversmith and the coppersmith and the gunsmith. Hello. The smith is that person who is skilled in metal. But the Lord said, I'm the one that created the man who makes the weapons. I have created the smith that bloweth the coal in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Not only did I create the man that made the guns and made the weapons, I created the one that uses them. And man can't spring anything on me that I don't know about. And because I'm familiar with every weapon and every weapon system that can be devised, that's why I can stand in a point of omniscience and omnipotence and say to you that out of everything man has made, everything he will make, out of everything the devil has forged in hell, and everything the devil will come up with, out of all of the weapons, past, present, and future, God said, I make you this promise, no weapon. That's formed against thee shall prosper. I'm just about finished. But understand here that weapons fall into broadly two categories. There is what is called offensive weapons and defensive weapons. The offensive weapon that you attempt to reach out and hit the enemy. The defensive weapon is the one that you use to try and protect yourself. We remember that during the war in the Gulf, when the, the man from uh, Saddam Hussein, that's who I'm trying to think of, decided that, well, if the United States drops a bomb in Baghdad, we're going to attack Israel. And when they start shooting their Scud missiles, at first the Scud missiles, uh, if it didn't just fall short on its own, would hit its target. But they came up with an anti-missile missile that once the Scud was launched, this missile was to intercept the Scud. Sometimes it did and sometimes it missed. But I want you to know that God's anti-missile system it doesn't ever miss. Every time the enemy shoots a dart in your direction, God said, I've got an anti-missile missile that's called my word. And it doesn't matter how the enemy shoot at you, I can intercept his shot in midair. I can stop his missile before it even leaves out of the weapon projectile. I can stop it midway between the enemy and you or I can let you see it coming and be close enough to feel the heat and stop it just before it gets there that's why I don't want you to worry because whatever weapon the devil shoot at you if you've done what I told you he'll not be able to penetrate for when I told you in my word to put on the helmet of salvation Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Have your lawns girded about with truth. And then have in your hand 
which is the shield of faith. It doesn't matter what the devil shoot at you. He doesn't have the power to penetrate. And when you get through surviving his attack, I've given you one weapon. My God, everything else is defensive. But I've given you one offensive weapon. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. No matter what the devil shoot at you, God said, I didn't give you but one weapon to fight offensively. And that is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if you put on what I told you, if you have in your hand what I gave you, no weapon. Turn to somebody and tell them, I don't know what you're going through. And I don't know what the devil is shooting in your direction. But you have God's promise. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I'm closing. I'm fixing to go to my seat. But one thing I want to add as a footnote. After he says no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Then he comes up and say and every tongue. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee. Thou shalt condemn in the judgment. Now the reason he didn't put the tongue as one of the weapons is because it doesn't matter how bad folk talk. Like it's always been said, words can't hurt you. Folk can lie all they want to, but it's not a weapon. They can threaten all they want to, but it's not a weapon. God said all you gotta do is don't worry about folk talking. I didn't put the wagon tongue under the category of weapons. Folk that lie on you, God said, I'll give you a chance to deal with them later. If they really got something to hurt you, God said, I won't let the weapon that's formed against you prosper. And then when it comes to all the junk they're saying, God said, I'm going to give you a chance to face them in the judgment. And every tongue that condemn you in the judgment, you can condemn them. You can tell them like Job, you are nothing but miserable comforters. You're not speaking the truth. My witness is in heaven. My record is on high. God knows. Now turn to somebody and tell them God promised that you don't have to worry about weapons. But he also promised that you don't have to worry about loose tongues. Ah, glory. I gotta go on my seat. This isn't one of my best days. Hallelujah, but I feel my help coming anyhow. Oh, glory. Satan is busy trying to destroy the people of the living God. But God wants you to have courage and let the devil know that it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how you come at me. I'm gonna be like little David. You come to me with a sword and a spear, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Satan, get out of my way because God has given me the power. He told me I could run through your troops, leap over your walls. I better steal Satan. He told me I could rub all over you. So get down where you belong. You belong under my feet. Ah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch somebody and tell them Satan can't hurt you. Hey. Hallelujah. You see, you gotta realize that on Calvary, God had said, seed of the woman is gonna bruise the serpent's head. On Calvary, 
the blood of Jesus pounded Satan's skull. He doesn't have the power that he had. He may be as a roaring lion, but he's a lion without teeth. His teeth have decayed. He's got a loud growl, but he don't have much in the way of a bite. And the bad thing about a growling lion, he may not have the power to hurt you, but if you are not careful, he'll make you hurt yourself. And you got to quit running in the stuff, running from the devil's growl. All he's got is a growl because Jesus took his teeth on Calvary. He don't have the power that he used to have because the Lord said, I got the key of hell and death. I'm holding it in my hand. Whatever Satan is trying to do to you, it will not prosper. Whatever the enemy has tried to do, laugh in his face. He can't hurt you because God said no weapon. Ah, glory! Glory to God! Glory to God! Glory to God! Glory to God! Well, did one leader say in years gone by <laughs> that we have nothing to fear? but fear itself we're around here killing ourselves running from the devil who don't have the power that you think he got hello somebody look at somebody and tell them god did not give you the spirit of fear but he gave you power that's why the devil can't hurt you that's why his weapons won't prosper. Woo! Can you tell somebody, I'm through worrying about the devil. The devil with the devil. God told me that he will not prosper. Hey, hey, hey. You ought to lift up your voice and praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey.
Bless the name of Jesus. My, 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 my. Hallelujah. Go ahead and raise them in the house. In spite of the praise the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and give him the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. God, we praise you for your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the strong and yoke of the enemy. Thank you, Lord, for promising us that it won't prosper. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for strength. We thank you for victory. Hallelujah. Thank you for victory. Thank you for victory. Oh, we praise your name, Jesus. Glory to your name. Come on, let's praise him. Open your mouth. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. We're going to sing that one more time and you're going to take your seats and we're going to get out of here. But whatever you're going through, we're going to praise God in spite of it. Because the very thing that you're going through may be the thing that's going to help you to go higher and higher in Him. Thou art worthy in spite of what I'm going through. Thou art worthy. Thou Art worthy, O oh Lord, hallelujah, to receive glory, my, 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 glory and honor, glory and honor and power. If there's a sin in this building today, tired of your sinful lifestyle. I want you to know that God loves you. He doesn't love what you're doing. But you as a person, God loves you. And today he's come to let you know that he can give you a brand new life. The enemy is destroying you through drugs and alcohol. But the Lord is saying he's going to give you the power today to overcome what the enemy has put on you. If you're a sinner lost in your sinful ways, don't know Jesus and the pardoning of your sins, come to the altar right now. Hallelujah. And then there's a backslider in this building today. You know the voice of God. You see the presence of God in this place. But yet, you're backslidden. You're not in the grace and fellowship of God. But the Lord is calling for backsliders to come on home. You left the ark of the covenant of God. You left the protection of God. But right now, in the name of Jesus, you can come back under his fellowship. That's right, my sister. Oh, 